Okay, chapter 19 is on vibrations and waves. So a vibration means something's moving back and forth periodically about an equilibrium position. And when many particles are vibrating and kind of connected to one another, you can get a wave which moves energy through space, like water waves or light waves or sound waves. And so here, for example, is a model of a bunch of particles that are making up what looks like a water wave. And so the individual particles, if you look at any one of them, they're all just wiggling back and forth. They're vibrating around an equilibrium position. But you can also see the wave crests actually moving along and carrying energy with them. So a pendulum is something that's, uh, that vibrates. And uh, the period is defined as the time it takes for a pendulum to swing back and forth one time. And for a pendulum, the longer the length of the pendulum, the longer the period. So this mass on a string has a short period. This mass on a longer string has a longer period. A sine curve is one way of visualizing a wave. So for example, if you have a pendulum that has a little bag of sand on the bottom with a hole that lets the sand um, fall out, and you have a piece of paper dragged underneath it, this pendulum will trace out a sine wave as it swings back and forth. A sine wave has an amplitude, which means the, the, how, uh, how wiggly it is. So the amplitude is defined as the distance from the midpoint out to either a crest or a trough. These are the crests, these are the troughs. And the wavelength is the distance between adjacent crests or adjacent troughs. Frequency is how frequently a vibration occurs. It has unit hertz, and some examples are pendula have one hertz, one uh, vibration per second, or maybe less than that, or slightly more. Sound has frequencies of uh, hundreds or thousands of hertz. Radio waves can have millions of hertz frequencies, and cell phones operate at the billions of hertz or gigahertz. And period and frequency are related by the equation period equals 1 over the frequency. Period in seconds, frequency in hertz. Or frequency is 1 over the period. So again, frequency in hertz, period in seconds. So in these curves, if you have a long period like this black oscillator, then that is a low frequency oscillation. If you have this blue oscillator, the period is a little shorter, quite a lot shorter, and the frequency is much higher. Wave speed describes how fast the crests or the troughs move through a medium. So it's the speed of the disturbance. And that is related to the frequency and wavelength. Wave speed is the frequency times the wavelength. For example, here are waves where the wavelength is one meter. This bird standing here sees the water going up and down with a frequency of one hertz. So one hertz times one meter equals one meter per second. There's two kinds of waves, transverse waves and longitudinal. In the transverse wave, the direction of vibration is perpendicular to the direction that energy tra travels. This is characterized by sort of a side-to-side -side movement, and examples would be a vibration in a string or electromagnetic waves, such as light and radio. The electric field oscillates perpendicular to the direction that the, that the light moves. In a longitudinal wave, the uh, direction of the oscillation is parallel to the direction that the energy travels. It's like a backward and for forward movement, and it sets up compressions and rarefactions. And the best example of this is a sound wave. So here's a sound wave. Uh, there's a speaker off to the left. This is shown in very, very slow motion. And as this speaker oscillates back and forth, when it pushes to the right, it creates a uh, compression region, and that compression region travels away from the speaker at the speed of sound. And as the speaker oscillates, there's multiple compression regions separated by rarefaction regions, where the density is a little lower. 
And so in this compression region, the density is a little higher. Also, the pressure of the air is a little higher, which is why sound is sometimes called a pressure wave. But again, if you look at this little red, we've colored this molecule of air red, look at any molecule, all the molecules are just vibrating back and forth, while the wave carries energy uh, from place to place. Interference occurs when one, two or more waves exist at the same place, and the superposition principle is just the disturbance of one wave uh, plus the disturbance of the other wave equals the disturbance of the resulting wave. So when two sine waves are traveling along in the same place and their crests match up with the, their crests and the troughs match up with the troughs, this can uh, create a wave which has a greater amplitude than either of the original waves. And that is called constructive interference. However, if two sine waves are added up and the crests of one wave match troughs from the other, or troughs from one match the crest from the other, then the resulting wave can have a lower amplitude. And in fact, if they, they can even cancel out so that there's no sound at all. This is destructive interference. So standing waves are a result of interference, where you shake one end of a rope and there's a fixed wall which reflects a wave and what happens is the incident wave uh, interferes with the reflective wave and sends up, sets up the standing wave. Standing waves are characterized by nodes and antinodes. A node is a region where the disturbance is always zero. So here are two waves. The red wave is traveling from left to right. The green wave is traveling from right to left. And they're superposition or their, their final wave is this blue wave going up and down. And you can see this is a node where there's no, uh, there's never any uh, vibration. It's, it's no, uh, sound is quiet there. And anti-nodes are in between adjacent nodes and that's where you have maximum disturbance. How you make a standing wave? Well, you just have to tie one end of the string and shake the other end. And this will create like a, a big standing wave. If you shake that string with twice, twice the frequency, you'll create another standing wave that has a node in the middle and two antinodes. If you shake the string with three times the original frequency, then you can set up another standing wave that has two nodes and three antinodes. And in fact, standing waves is how all musical instruments work. Any stringed instrument is send, setting up standing waves in a string, like a guitar. And any wind, wind instrument is actually setting up uh, standing sound waves in a tube of air. The Doppler effect. So if there's a source of sound which is not moving, and you listen to it, you hear the frequency that it is emitting, called the rest frequency. If the source is moving, you might hear a different frequency. For example, if it's moving towards you, you will hear a frequency that's higher than the rest frequency. And if the source is moving away from you, you will hear a frequency that is lower than the rest frequency. This is, and then if you measure the difference between the frequency you hear and the frequency that you know was emitted, the rest frequency, you can actually measure the speed of the source. And this is how these Doppler guns work when a police officer measures the speed of your car. It's sending out uh, waves which are reflected off your car and he knows what the frequency of the wave, the original frequency of the waves is, and he can measure the frequency of the waves that are reflected off your car. And from that difference in frequency, he can measure what your speed is and give you a ticket. And the Doppler effect geometrically is quite simple. The police car is moving uh, from left to right here. And so if you look at these crests uh, or wave fronts, they'll be bunched up uh, in the direction that the police car is traveling and stretched out behind the car. So this wavelength is longer behind the car and longer wavelength corresponds to lower frequency. So if the siren's rest, uh, rest frequency sounds like wee, then this girl will hear a wee. But this boy in front, the 
the waves are all bunched up here, so you have lower, sort of shorter wavelength, which corresponds to higher frequency. And so instead of hearing wee, you'll hear a wee sound. Okay, so chapter 20 is on sound. So first of all, sound is a form of energy that exists whether or not it is heard. If a tree falls in the forest, well, then there will be all this snapping and releasing of energy, and that will send sound waves out into the environment, whether or not anyone is there to hear it. So sound waves are produced by the vibrations of matter. For example, in a piano, a violin, or a guitar, the sound is produced by a, by a vibrating string. In a saxophone, there's a vibrating reed. In a flute, there's a fluttering column of air at the mouthpiece. And in my voice, uh, my vocal cords are vibrating. Normally, there's uh, the original vibration stimulates the vibration of something that's larger or more massive. For example, on this violin, the original vibration is the string, but then this wooden sounding board uh, also vibrates and is what produces most of the sound. Uh, the air column in a reed or wind instrument it, uh, also is, is the more massive thing that, that vibrates. Uh, the air in your throat of the mouth of a singer vibrates as a result of the original vibrations of the vocal cords. So this vibrating material then sends the disturbance through the surrounding medium, like the air, in the form of longitudinal sound waves. So the frequency of the sound wave is the same as the frequency of the vibrating source, and our impression of the frequency is called pitch. So, for example, uh, this piano uh, has lots of different keys, and each key has a different pitch. So there's a C, if you go lower and lower and lower pitch, a lower frequency, that's called lower pitch. And the lowest uh, note on the piano is this A, which has a frequency of 27.5 hertz. The highest note on the piano has a frequency of 4,186 hertz. And our ears can hear in the range from about 20 hertz to up to 20,000 hertz. And as we grow older, this limit decreases. So sound waves with frequencies below 20 hertz are called uh, infrasonic or infrasound, and sound waves with frequencies above 20,000 hertz are ultrasonic or called ultrasound, and humans cannot hear infrasound or ultrasound, although giraffes can hear frequencies uh, in the infrasound below uh, 20 hertz, and dogs we know can hear uh, sounds with frequencies above 20,000 hertz, so ultrasound. So sound waves are vibrations that are made of compressions and rarefactions. In a compression region, the density and pressure are slightly greater. So if you open the door in this room, it'll compress the air. And in a rarefaction, the density and pressure are slightly lower than the average. And so if you slam the door, there'll be a rarefaction wave, which will travel out and pull the curve inwards. The wavelength of sound is the distance between uh, adjacent compressions or rarefactions. So there it is. As these two uh, compressions go by, the distance between them is called the wavelength. So here's how sound is heard. First you need a source, such as this loudspeaker has a paper cone that's vibrating. That pushes and pulls the air molecules next to the loudspeaker and sets them into motion. And that produces compressions and rarefactions which travel outward through the air. And then it hits a detector, such as your ear, eardrum, or a microphone, which sets up a vibration in the detector. And for example, in this microphone, that produces an electric current, which we can then uh, record in our computers. Sound doesn't just travel through air, it can also travel through uh, liquids or solids. In a liquid or solid, uh, the atoms are closer together, so the speed of sound is greater. It's about four times greater in water than it is in air, and 15 times greater in steel than it is in air, which is why sometimes you can hear a train coming before, uh, before you can hear it with your ears. You can hear it by listening down at the, at the rail. 
The speed of sound in air depends on temperature, pressure, and humidity, but it's about 330 meters per second. And we know that it tends to rise by about half a meter per second per degree of Celsius. But one of the consequences of this is that light, which travels at 300,000 kilometers per second, travels almost instantaneously. So if there's a bolt of lightning, uh, you see it before you hear it. And if you actually count the seconds between when you see it, which is instantaneous, and when you hear it, uh, and you divide by three, that'll give you the approximate distance to the source uh, in kilometers. It's a third of a kilometer per second. So sound can be reflected off of walls. This is called echoes or reverberations. And sound can also be refracted. So if uh, you have warm air below and cool air above, the sound will travel faster through the warm air and can actually bend the waves upwards. If uh, it's reversed, it can bend the waves downwards. And Reflections and rarefactions will happen inside solid and uh, liquids, like inside your body. And so there's something called ultrasonic imaging, which is when a device sends high-frequency sounds into the body and records the reflected waves that are produced um, from organs and other bones and things inside your body. So this is an alternative to using x-rays. You can just send sound waves. And this was uh, sent into my wife in early 2011, and we saw an image of my, my daughter before she was born. So every object, it turns out, has some natural frequency that it wants to vibrate on. This depends on the elasticity of the object, the mass of the object, its shape, and its size. So, for example, these tuning forks, if you hit any one of them with a hammer, they'll vibrate at some natural frequency. There's also something called forced vibrations. So if you have a motor, like some machinery or a paint shaker or something, you can uh, force oscillations to happen at any frequency that you want. And resonance is uh, the phenomena in which the frequency of the forced vibrations matches the object's natural vibration frequency. Uh, an example here is two identical tuning forks. If one of them is already shaking, you can set up sympathetic vibrations in, an, in another tuning fork that's nearby. And this is a phenomenon of resonance. It's because this frequency is matched to the natural frequency of this tuning fork. Another example, if you're pushing a swing, and you push with the same, as the, same frequency as the natural frequency of the swing, then the amplitude increases. Uh, if your radio is tuned to the right frequency, you can pick up on a particular radio station. Also, when troops, if they're marching in a, at a certain rhythm, and that matches the rhythm of a bridge, you can actually uh, destroy the bridge by marching over, which is why troops are not allowed to march in rhythm when they go over a bridge. It's just to go out of step. Uh, here's an example of exactly something like that happening. Back in 1940, there was a suspension bridge going over the Tacoma Narrows, and uh, the way the wind went through these narrows set up a, a forced vibration, which matched the resonance fre uh, frequency of this bridge, unfortunately. And so what eventually happened is it collapsed the bridge about six months after it was first built. Pretty dramatic. So interference. Uh, we learned about this a little bit in the previous chapter, but if you have two waves that are in phase, they produce uh, a wave that has an increased amplitude. This is true for longitudinal waves as well. If these two waves are in phase, so the compressions match the compressions, the rarefactions match the rarefractions, then you get a wave with increased intensity. However, if waves are out of phase, you, they'll cancel each other out, and you can just get a, a zero zero amplitude wave. And this is true as well with longitudinal waves. If the uh, compressions match the rarefactions in, in this wave and the com compressions ma match the rarefactions in this wave, they can cancel each other out and get zero sound. So there's something called sound cancelling headphones that actually have uh, microphones inside the headphones that listen to the surrounding sound and produce mirror image wave patterns that are fed into your ear so that it cancels the sound out. So you can be in a noisy airplane and uh, get some peace and quiet. 
And finally, uh, there's beats. So if you have two waves of similar but not equal frequencies and you superpose them, you can get this phenomenon of beating where the sound that's produced gets loud because of constructive interference and then later quiet because of destructive interference, and then loud again and then quiet again. And this is, has an application when you're tuning pianos. If you have a known frequency source, like a tuning fork or something, and you play it at the same time as a, as a piano key, and you hear beats, then you know that the frequency is, is not quite the same. And if you make those beats go away, then the frequency is the same. And you can do this the same thing if you're tuning an orchestra to a piano tone. You're listening for the beats and you're trying to make them uh, get, get slower and go away.